Hey, hey, hey. <clears throat> Let's get into it, y'all. What up, crew? What's good? Are you guys ready for another episode of the Crew Book Club Podcast? Yes, let's get into it. How are you guys feeling today? I hope you guys are feeling great. I hope you're feeling good. And it's okay for things to be normal. I was having a conversation with somebody about being excited. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. And then when I thought, when I finished the conversation, I was like, what are you so excited about again? <laughs> but I was like, I'm excited about the fact that I don't have no drama going on. I'm learning to set boundaries. I'm learning how to recognize when I'm having a moment of struggle with peace and I know what I need to do to get back in the right state of mind. That feels so good. Recognizing when I'm having a moment and knowing how to get out of it. Because a lot of us do not know how to do that. And this is why I do this pod, to share how I do that, to share the books and having these aha moments and just being excited about normalcy. Being excited about things not being chaotic. And I think that's a really good place to be in. Now, if you're not feeling great, that's okay too. Just don't sit in it for too long. And I think that's why it's so important to find things that brings joy outside of shopping and spending money because we'll do those things for a small gratification, but be right back in that state of mind after the wear of that new purse or new bag goes away. That's why I think journaling, being in the presence of God, and therapy is top three, <laughs> okay? Because when you start to heal from within, those other things, material-wise, don't even matter. But anyway, <laughs> I know that's coming in a little strong already, but I just want to always keep it real with y'all, okay? So being excited about nothing crazy happening is a good thing, <laughs> okay? So let's get into who gonna check me, boo? God is, y'all. God is always checking us. I love a good check. Woo! It keeps me on my toes. It keeps me on point. It really makes me know that I'm in his presence. And I know God got my back, okay? God always has my back, regardless. So that kind of prompts for how the Believe Bigger um, day comes into play. Continuous covering was the one that I went back and looked at. And it's day 33. And the scripture for that day was Joshua chapter 9. I mean, chapter 1, verse 9. It says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Okay? Wherever we go, God got us. All right? She says in here, it's okay to be shaken. It's okay to grieve and even be shell-shocked. That doesn't make you flawed, y'all. That makes you someone ready to um, ready to receive supernatural revelation, support, healing, and focus. God doesn't abandon us the way imperfect people in unpredictable circumstances do, okay? He gonna be there for us. People can disappoint us, betray us isolate us they can do whatever they want but just know god is continuing to cover you so i love how it was just like letting me know you don't know who i am i'm a child of god you better you better stop playing with me and i'm gonna continue to be strong and courageous out here in this peace i'm not gonna be afraid or discouraged because of the things that are happening to me i'm gonna keep it pushing what is it i'm gonna keep it p am i using that right y'all <laughs> If not, that's how I'm going to use it. I'm going to keep it pee. I'm going to keep it pushing because God got me. Okay? All right. So that was the who going to check me, boo. God is. He always checking us. And, oh, before I forget, I'm going to say the prayer because I feel like um, it was really good. It says, Lord, you are perfect in every way. You are with me in this moment and guiding me deeper into your peace and power-filled presence. You hear that? Peace, power-filled presence. 
ain't nothing like being in God's presence because it brings so much peace. I love it. So let's get into something else that I love. Ew, ew, ew. I love me some crew love. Just loving a crew. Hey, I just love crew love. And when I scroll, because I do be checking y'all, I love going to the review page and looking at the love that I received. And this week I received some love from KLab20. It says amazing girl time. <laughs> This podcast is so refreshing, encouraging, motivating, all while helping you get your life. Every time I listen, I feel like I'm having a conversation with my sister friends. Grab your journal or a glass of wine and catch all this good tea to becoming a better you. Yes, girls, grab your journal, grab your wine. Let's become better people let's become better versions of ourselves you know god ch turned water into wine so it's okay to have the scripture and get checked and, and drink some wine okay <laughs> i love that thank you for that review thank you for the crew love i really appreciate it listen i know i had somebody say well i don't have an iphone to leave you a real review we all know somebody with an iphone okay so whenever you with somebody i need you to grab their iphone subscribe to my <laughs> to the podcast and then i need you to leave a review if you don't and if you're on any other platform definitely still leave five stars if you can comment join a conversation prompt the conversation youtubers definitely subscribe and follow the page as well and you know you can always go to the crew book club and on instagram fan base um what's we on and tiktok yes i got on tiktok thanks to my coach but yeah, and we can communicate there. Anyway, thank you for sharing your crew love, KLab20. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, love. Continue to listen and enjoy your time with the crew. All right. Now, y'all know we be on a go, go, go. One of my favorite things about podcasts is I can listen to them wherever I'm at. You know, super easy, super quick. And that's why I partner up with Audible because they have podcasts too, guys. They have wellness programs that you can go in there and check out theoretical performances, comedy, and Audible originals. The best thing is the audiobooks. I know all of us don't have time to sit and read, so you can definitely go on Audible and do that as well. And if you go to audibletrial.com slash crewlove, that's audible, T-R-A-I-L, dot com slash crewlove, you get free 30 days to experience um, their Audible premium program. So I'm telling y'all, you don't want to miss that, okay? I can't wait to listen to the wheel book because that is in the pipeline. Not because of what happened at the Oscars. I literally had talked about doing that book before all of that even happened, <laughs> okay? So I'm not jumping on no bandwagon. And even if it was, it's my prerogative. Okay, all right, I'm done. <laughs> Let's get into the main topic of today. The book, the Bam, bam, bam. Set Boundaries, Find Peace, A Guide to Reclaiming Yourself by Nedra Glover Tawab. Y'all, this book, I cannot. I, I literally opened it up when I was talking to somebody to give them an example <laughs> on how I needed to say to set my boundary. And it worked. <laughs> it really did work. So I really love that you can literally read quotes on what to say to people when they disrespecting your boundary, okay? But anyway, we're doing chapter three. Why don't we have healthy boundaries? And chapter four, the six types of boundaries. Because then if we know the six types of boundaries, we can identify them and we can know how to handle them. So on page 48, which is the start of chapter three, and I remember telling y'all, each chapter has a scenario and story to bring it to real life. And she literally used clients she worked with, but they're not their own name. So while I'm reading it, just put your name in there if you want, <laughs> okay? This particular story talked about Justin needed to learn how to acknowledge his emotional needs and allow others to be there for him. Oh, I'm going to raise my hand on that. During his parents' divorce, he came to the conclusion that his needs were too complicated for others and that he was better at giving support than receiving it. It was clear that his relationship issues were product of an emotional neglect he experienced as a child. I feel like that's a lot of us. That's a lot of us where we just get to the point where 
we don't think we can't our needs are that important so then we just realize oh maybe giving support is better to to receive it and you hear that saying too it's better to give than to receive but in this situation we cannot neglect ourselves and i like how she distinguished the difference between emotional abuse and emotional neglect it says the difference between emotional abuse and emotional neglect emotional neglect is unintentional while emotional abuse is more deliberate. Mm. Emotional neglect happens when you don't receive sufficient emotional support from a partner or a caregiver. People who experience emotional neglect tend to have issues developing healthy attachments to others, whether their attachment is anxiousness or avoidance. Ooh. I think mine was definitely and relationships in college i really didn't have boyfriends i didn't want to put a label on anything and i've had there were some guys that were very had potential but from what i experienced as a child and what i saw like my mom go through i was like avoid relationships at all costs i never want to get married i never want to have kids like totally didn't happen <laughs> but as I started to realize, I had to experience things on my own. But I was definitely avoiding, like, serious relationships. I would cut dudes off so quick. We might go on a few dates or whatnot. But when they realized I wasn't emotional available to them, I wasn't your typical girl, they would disappear. And I probably... <laughs> it's probably a good thing. But, yeah, I was a little savage. I was a little savage. But it definitely showed up. Um, thank God my husband was... Um, he was strong enough to stick around, okay? So kudos to him for sticking around and loving me just as I am, but also helping me elevate and grow. Shout out to him. Love you, hubby. Anyway, let me continue. <laughs> uh, we don't realize it, and I didn't even realize it until recently, that a lot of solutions to a lot of my problems are setting boundaries, and this book has made that very clear. And a lot of times, it used to be like, it's them. It ain't me. They need to check themselves. They need to change. But she debunks that in page 49 through 42. It's them, not me. For our relationships to improve, we assume that the other person has to change. But here's the accountability part. When we do set boundaries, our relationship change because we've changed what we're willing to tolerate. He. Oh, on that, on that, okay? In this section, she says, we tried once and it failed. Okay, what we do after we stated what we want is so vital. That goes back to in the beginning, I think it was chapter one, where we discussed once we set the boundary and communicate it, we need to be putting it into action ourselves. It also says here, there's more to boundaries than just saying no, Yes, because we have to show people that we're taking our own boundaries and we're, we're setting the boundary and we're respecting them ourselves and we're maintaining them, right? Here in this section, it says the reasons we tolerate boundary issues, okay? This is where I had to highlight. We focus on the worst case scenario. Despite the fact that the worst case scenario is often the least likely to occur, our fears of the worst tend to keep us from setting boundaries. Here are some typical worst case scenario thoughts. Them darn what ifs, y'all. It says, what if they get mad at me? What if they want nothing to do with me? What if I lose a friend or family member? What if I say the wrong thing? Is setting a boundary petty? What if I'm called selfish? I don't think anyone will listen to me. I can tell you mine were definitely, what if I'm called selfish? And what if I lose a friend slash family member? And what was the other one? Yeah, those are the ones that I kind of dealt with. Um, it says worst case scenario thinking is fear-based and it's the wrong hypothesis about what is most likely to happen. We can't predict the future. We can't predict how people will respond to our boundaries. The only thing we're able to control is our own behavior. That's that accountability. I love that. Okay, listen to this also. 
Family is where it starts. <laughs> Let me tell you about it. It, it says, parent caregivers can give us, can guide us toward either healthy or unhealthy boundaries. Mother, father, and others in the home environment, including siblings and extended family. Parent and caregivers typically feel comfortable communicating, feel comfortable communicating our expectations to children, but children often feel they don't have a right to set boundaries for themselves. I struggle with this even as an adult. Just recently in the past year or so, I was really able to set clear boundaries with my mama. I don't know about y'all, but being black in a, in a household with a black, being raised by a black mama, especially their generation, I'm 35. So that's where I'm, I'm talking about the moms of our generation. Boy, boundary what, child? You better stay in a child's place. So this leads into one of the most important aspects of what I'm trying to change, respecting kids' boundaries. I think I'm changing the narrative on how I handle my kid. And some people may be like, oh, she need a beating or she need this. And I remember my, I was having this conversation with um, my dad about he got whooped, I got whooped. But then when I think about our relationship, I'm like, that that's the issue. The It felt like abuse in a sense, or you didn't care how I felt. And because I had an opinion on something, your reaction is to beat me. Because I was wrong and you was right because you're the parent. But I'm trying to change that narrative with my kid. And she talks about that in here. And one of the things that I feel like maybe a lot of us can understand is, is this particular scenario. When a child sets a boundary such as, I don't want to hug your friend, how does the parent respond? Which is some of the, some of the ways. One, allow the child to be selective about whom they feel comfortable showing affection to. Two, push the child to hug the friend. Or three, shame or threaten this child by saying, it's not nice to tell people no when they ask you for a hug. Or if you don't hug them, you'll get a spanking. I remember like out here, oh, that's disrespectful if you don't hug the elder or, or whatnot. But then honestly, Here's an, it says on page 54 as well, here's an idea on what the child understands about their ability to set boundary. Option one, I hear you. If you feel uncomfortable showing someone affection, I will respect the preference. Option two, your boundaries are not important to me and I know what's best for you. Option three, you will be punished for having preferences. Don't embarrass your parents. Other people's feelings are more important than your own. Ooh, that one, yikes. I, I like that I hear you. If you feel uncomfortable showing someone affection, I will respect your preferences. It says to raise healthy children, it's essential to allow them to have healthy boundaries. So good. Parents who don't model healthy boundaries inadvertently teach kids unhealthy boundaries. I can't remember what episode it was, but it talked about legacy and how our behavior as parents affect our kids. And I just want to show my child that I know how to respect boundaries and and I know how to set them. And I want her to see like, oh, my mommy don't tolerate this. My mommy don't tolerate that. So when she gets older, she'll feel comfortable in knowing what's a healthy boundary and a non-healthy boundary. And I know some people are like, well, she's only this, this age. It doesn't matter. It starts early. It starts now. So when we're, the work that we're doing for ourselves is going to affect our kids and that goes back to uh i was having a conversation with my husband about this and how like genetically how we heal can transfer into our kids so don't make your healing about you all the time think about your kids your kids kids you could be changing the generational not just wealth but emotional and mental states of mind as well so we have more than a responsibility of just taking care of our child financially. We need to make sure we prepare them more so mentally for the world. So I really love how she gives examples on what to do and how to do that in the chapter in respecting kids' boundaries and us becoming the model parent to show our kids healthy and unhealthy boundaries. 
Okay, so let's end chapter three on this. The uncomfortable feelings that may arise from setting boundaries. Guilt, one. Two, sadness. Three, betrayal. And four, remorse. The two things that I struggle with is guilt and betrayal. Guilt is there is no way to avoid guilt. You have to cope with the discomfort. It's part of the process at establishing boundaries. The author made that very clear on page 64. Betrayal on page 65. It says setting boundaries is not a betrayal of your family, friends, partner, work, or anyone or anything else. Not setting them, however, is a betrayal of yourself. Don't betray yourself to please others. Woo! Changing the way you think about setting limits helps manage the discomfort associated with set, um, setting them. That whole don't betray yourself to please others is a rewind in my mind. Every time I make a decision on what I'm doing, I'm like, let me make sure I'm doing this for the right reason and I'm not betraying myself, okay? So I really love that. There's so much dopeness in chapter three. You definitely need to check it out. And to better help me deal with setting boundaries and recognizing me having to set boundaries because I've been through so much betrayal and dealt with a lot of guilt and resentment. One of the reasons why I had to get into therapy because my 20s was a whole bunch of people pleasing and doing what others wanted and then being betrayed by those same people that I was doing things for. It hurt. It hurt. So that's one of the reasons why it catapulted me into therapy. And it's crazy how you have to go through the worst things. So I'm trying to get us in our community comfortable with therapy. That's why I partnered up with BetterHelp um, to sponsor this episode because I actually used them one. And this week was a struggle with one relationship this week. And I was just like, we need to get in therapy because... I don't want this to get out of hand. I'm trying to be preventative and I feel like staying in therapy is like a well-oiled machine. It's like you need to be in therapy maybe not every week and every day after but you need to be there every now and then to get recharged and to, re to reset and I was like man we might need some, some better help um, but I do suggest that you guys use BetterHelp. It's really good. It's convenient. It's inexpensive. And even if you're having financial struggles, you can apply to get some financial assistance as well. So don't forget, crew, I partner up with BetterHelp for a special offer to the Crew Book Club podcast listeners. You can get 10% of your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash crew love. That's better h e l p dot com slash crew love. Okay. The link will be in the show notes as well. I just I just highly recommend therapy. I don't know how much I can stress it enough and how much it has helped me. Another thing is I want to say this. If you're in a relationship with somebody and they feel like they don't need therapy, you don't have to do it with them. Still go yourself because I experienced that. My husband do not think <laughs> he need therapy or we need therapy. And I still went on my own. I was willing to cut buying certain things to go to therapy because that's how important it was. And now that I've had therapy and I'm continuing my education through self-help books and books like this, it has given me a level of peace that I cannot deny. So I highly recommend therapy. Some God in therapy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's get into chapter four. It's the six types of um boundaries there are physical boundaries sexual boundaries intellectual boundaries emotional boundaries material boundaries and time boundaries you know we don't have a lot of time to get into all of them so i'm going to choose the ones that i had a aha moment about or experience first one was intellectual boundaries complete aha moment listen to this on page 71 it says, intellectual boundaries refer to your thoughts and ideas. You're, you're free. You are free to have an opinion about anything you want. And when you express your opinion, your words shouldn't be dismissed, belittled, or ridiculed. 
Here are some examples of intellectual boundary violations. Calling someone names for their beliefs or opinions, yelling during disagreements, ridiculing someone of their views and thoughts, dismissing someone because of a disagreement, demeaning a child's mother, father in front of a child, telling children about problems they are emotional capable of handling. Woo! Ooh. Here's some setting an intellectual boundary sounds like this. You can disagree without being mean or rude. I don't think this is an appropriate conversation to have with a child. I won't talk to you if you keep raising your voice. That was a mean joke. I'm offended. I just said something and you dismissed me. Why? And here are a few ways to honor your intellectual boundaries. If you're a parent, refrain from discussing adult matters with your child. And two, be respectful of people who are different from you. I'm going to tell you this. Being in a relationship, husband and wife, whatever your significant other, I think we've all dealt with saying something intellectual to our spouse or significant other and them like totally dismissing it or not acknowledging what we said. So I really like the, I just said something and you dismiss me and asking why. Because if I know why you're doing it, then maybe we can have a conversation so you won't do it again, okay? So I really I really like how the books break down different ways to do that, okay? Let's talk about the last one that hit home. Emotional boundaries. Listen to this. So when someone belittles your emotions or invalidates your feelings, they are violating your emotional boundaries. This can make you feel uncomfortable the next time you want to express your emotions. Examples of emotional boundaries. There's about nine of them. But I'm going to give you my top five. One, emotional dumping, excessive venting, pushing someone to share information they aren't comfortable sharing, telling people how to feel such as you should be sad about that, minimizing the impact of something such as that wasn't a big deal, gossiping about the personal details of another person's life. Y'all, I did all of those in some shape a form of fashion and now that I know I can actually recognize it from reading this book so setting the emotional boundary sounds like this it gives us this example when I share things with you I expect you to keep them confidential and this one I hear that you have a lot of things going on I don't feel equipped to help you have you considered talking to a therapist and I don't feel comfortable talking about the topic or it isn't okay for you to tell me how I should feel. My feelings are valid. I will take my time processing my feelings. Don't rush me to move on. And it's okay for me to feel how I feel in any situation. I love how she gives us these examples to respond. And... I mean, if somebody get mad at you for saying these things, then maybe they need to be put on ice, okay? I like how she says this too. Here are a few ways to honor your emotional boundaries. This is where that um, communication and action come in. Ask people if they want you to just listen or if they're looking for feedback. This will help you determine whether or not to offer suggestions. Two, share only with people you can trust who can indeed hold the space for your emotions. E ye ye. Listen, the first one, friends. My friends, I've known for a very long time. And a lot of times we come to each other for advice and acknowledge um, what we're going through and helping all of those things. But now I'm realizing a lot of times when we give that advice, we're giving it based on our own experiences and life decisions and our outcomes. And it's like, you know. Maybe I need to maybe I need to fall back and maybe what they're going through is too deep for me to say because I don't want to be the reason of the projection of someone else's outcome, if that makes sense. Like to tell someone, oh, I would leave him, child. No, that is not your responsibility to tell somebody to leave somebody. I don't even want their responsibility because then they're going to turn around. I left because of you. I don't even want that resentment. I think it's sometimes best to just be like, you know, that sounds really deep. How about you all? Have you all tried therapy? And another thing is, what per, what's so profounding is actually going to someone and saying, do you want me to respond and give my opinion or do you just want me to listen? Because a lot of times we just 
want to be heard. And I feel like that's the most respectful thing that you can ask someone because that way you're not spearing off how you feel and they never ask you that. And then uh, sometimes they could walk away from a conversation taking on what you said, feeling bad about it because that's not how they're handling the situation. So I really like how she put that in perspective. Like we don't have to take on that responsibility all the time. And sometimes it's best to direct our friends or whatever to therapy. Like I'm telling y'all, betterhelp.com slash cool love. <laughs> then to steer them into the wrong direction. Okay. So really good. She talks about all of these boundaries, but one boundary that I want to discuss and I want to make it the challenge of the week. The challenge of the week is to reclaim your time. I feel like we need to focus on time boundaries this week, which is discussed on page 75 through 76. It says time boundaries consist of how you manage your time, how you allow others to use your time, and how you deal with favor requests and how you structure your free time. If you don't have time for something you want to do, you don't have healthy boundaries with time. Point blank, period. Okay? Calling somebody multiple times in a row for a non-emergency, mm -mm, you violating. Expecting someone to drop everything in order to provide help to you, you violating. Calling or sending texts late when the recipient is sleeping, i.e. don't call, don't text or call me after 9.30. <laughs> uh, you violating. Ask others to do things for free. You violating. I love, man, over committing, violating. Having long conversations with emotional draining people, violating. Requesting favors at a time when it's clear the other person isn't available. Violating. Asking someone to stay late at work for no additional pay. Straight up violating. Accepting favor requests from people who won't reciprocate. Violation. Don't be out here violating. So the challenge this week is to reclaim your time. If you find yourself doing a whole bunch of stuff for other people and you're not doing the things that you enjoy, you need to evaluate your time boundaries so let's reclaim our time this week and focus on your time boundaries so that is the challenge of the week reclaim your time all right so let's get into what would the crew do Woo. Mm. i got two really good questions um from our crew when it came to boundaries one of them was about guilt and because the author kind of dives into that in chapter six, I'm going to save that question um, for another day. Uh, so stay tuned for that. I got you. Now, this week's question is about the parenting, which was perfect timing because we just talked about how a lot of those unhealthy boundaries come from when we were children. And the question was, as a parent, do you think of the long term impact of your work life balance decisions may have on your kids? And as an adult, do you remember or think about the work-life balance decisions your parents made? And do you think they shaped you as a person? I'm going to say this. There was times when I was young that I had visitation to my dad's house on the weekends. But I would constantly be left with my stepmom and my dad would never be there. And he it's because he was in real estate and he was a firefighter. And I kind of felt like as a kid, you didn't prioritize me at all. Like at least you could make time to be here for me. But now that I'm older, I avoided real estate for the longest time because I didn't want to be like my dad. But in actuality, I took control on how I handled my work-life balance. I try to do everything during the day. So when my daughter is home, that I'm attentive to her. When I am at a when she was cheering, I'm present, I'm paying attention. And also I communicate in a sense of like, okay, for mommy to be able to do this, how can I involve her to respect the time for me to work and things of that nature and communicating the responsibilities that come with being a parent, but also not overwhelming her in a sense. But I think like talking about time boundaries, I want to spend time with my kids. So I try to make it a clear boundary to be done with certain things by a certain time when she gets home so I can spend adequate time with her. I honestly think as people and as kids, we care more so about 
quality time than you being in a space with me and being on your phone honestly or really just honing in on what they're doing and this actually i think was prompt um i had a friend talk about an article about a lady who was like fortune um got a ceo of a fortune 500 job and she really didn't prioritize her kids <laughs> or whatnot which is fine but then it's like when she would go to their games she would still be doing crossword pu puzzles and not paying attention and i felt like why you even went to the game if I'm going to be there, I'm going to be attentive to my kid while I'm there. And that's that. So, yes, I don't think it has a long-term impact on our kids if we're communicating with them. But from what my parents, what I went through with my parents, yes, it kind of hurt a little bit. But the older I got, I respected it. And I decided I'm not going to be like that. And I was able to apply life and realize what was most important for me as an adult so that was my advice if you guys have any additional advice about that holla at your girl you can go to our instagram at the crew book club you can comment on our youtube channel we can start a conversation there and tell me what your thoughts are when it came to if what your parents work-life balance affected you as an adult and what do you plan to do different okay so that was so good. Let's get into the quote of the week. The quote of the week comes from chapter four in the beginning of the, the author of each, in the beginning of each chapter, the author puts a quote. And this one was by Mandy Hale. It's stating, it is necessary and vital to set boundaries for your life and the people you allow in it. Okay, let me read that again. It's necessary and vital to set standards for your life and the people you allow in it by Mandy Hill. Listen, y'all, let's go out. Let's reclaim our time. Let's set boundaries for the people we allow in our life. Because you know what? We about that boundary setting lifestyle, okay? That's the new flex is setting boundaries. I love y'all and I will see you guys next week right here on the crew book club podcast hey